and they run short of wine, W-I-N-E, wine. So his mother comes to him and says, son, look, these people are in a problem. They have run short of wine. Help them out. Believing that he's got mysterious powers to help these people solve the problem. So Jesus blurts out, according to the Bible, he says, woman, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Woman. In the whole of the 27 books of the New Testament, not once does he call his mother, mother. Woman, woman. I'm asking in the Hebrew language, is there no word for mother? This word woman he uses for the prostitute. Same word. You see, the woman who was caught, caught in the act, they bring her to Jesus. He said, look, this woman, we caught her in the act. What must we do to her? They're putting him to the test. They're trying to get him embroiled with the government or with the religious authorities. Either way, he loses. If he says, stone her, that was the law, book of Leviticus, that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. If he says, stone her as a man of God, he must abide by the law. Stone her. And they would have stoned her and killed her. And if they were apprehended by the law, by the government, they said, look, our Messiah told us to. This is what our Messiah said. So he's in conflict with the government. Because adultery was not a capital crime in the Roman Empire, nor is it today in Christendom. It is not a crime at all. Adultery is no crime. Did you know that? Adultery is not a crime in any Christian nation on earth. It's not a crime. The law will not hold you responsible for committing adultery. He calls the prostitute woman. Where are thine accusers? So he says, no, they are all gone. So he says, all right, go and sin no more. Woman. He says, there's not a single place he calls his mother, mother. In the Bible. So he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. So she persuades him. He says, look, man, help them out. These people are in difficulty. He says, all right, fill up the vats. You know, the wine vats. With water. And they fill it up. And he turned the water into wine. And they drank. And they remarked. The drunkards of the night who have been drinking, imbibing all night. They're remarking, why have you kept the best wine for the last? The best wine, why have you kept it to the last? So my brother Jimmy Swaggart, he says in his book, that that wine was pure grape juice. I said, brother, I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but I said, brother, Swaggart, you see if a man has an imbibing wine, for whole night and the things run dry and you give him pure grape juice that grape juice is like mud water to him because there is a law involved you drink 5% alcoholic drink 5% 5% after a while your senses are getting dull you need 10% to make you feel that it's alcohol something to give you a kick then you need 20% to make you to feel there is something potency in it you have to increase the alcoholic content to make you feel that it's better than the previous one, it's better than the previous one. If you give such a man grape juice, he says it's mud water, what is it? Insipid, no taste. <laughs> and he's telling us in his book called Alcohol, he says one of the, he's telling us, and I have no reason to contradict him unless you have, he said there are 11 million drunkards in America, 11 million drunkards. And 44 million heavy drinkers. Get that book, small book. I have a sample here, I think. Alcohol. 11 million drunkards and 44 million heavy drinkers. And he says, to me, there's no difference between the two. It means 55 million drunkards, as far as Jimmy Swaggart is concerned. In my country, they don't call them drunkards. It's an insult. The guy can punch you on the jaw if you call a man a drunkard. You have to call him alcoholic. You know, the poor man is sick. This is a sickness. He needs treatment. It's not a sin. Alcohol is not a sin. It's a sickness. Jimmy Swaggart calls a spade a spade. He said, drunkards. 55 million drunkards in America. 11 million drunkards and heavy drinkers. I said, I make no difference. I said, yes, brother. I said, go a step further. Islam will take you a step further. He said, even your social drinkers are on the same level. They're breaking the laws and commandments of God as given in the last and final revelation of God. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. 
no excuse for a nip or a tot. The Holy Quran says, Ya you lazin amun. Oh, you who believe in namal khamru, most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru, and gambling, wal ansabu, and fortune telling, wal aslamu, and idol worship, rizum minamal shaitan, and an abomination of Satan's handiwork, fachtani buhula Allah kum tuflihun. It's a shan such abomination that you may prosper. And one pronouncement, he created the biggest society of teetotalers in the world. 1,000 million Muslims, as a people, as a whole, they don't imbibe that filth. We have our black sheep. We are not all angels. We know some Muslims can bring the Christian under the table. That you know. We are ashamed of them. But as a people, as a whole, the biggest society of teetotalers, people who don't imbibe, are the Muslims. And what did it? This word of God. This is a miracle. You perform a million miracles and you can't change people. Here, without any miracles, he transforms nations. This is a miracle. What miracle are you talking about? So, the Quranic first miracle of Jesus, he spoke and defended his mother against an unbelieving audience. The first miracle of Jesus, he turned water into wine. Since then, wine has flowed like water in Christendom. And there's no way out. The preachers, Jimmy Swaggart is telling us, there's a book called Preachers, and he's telling us in that book, he said they're at a church conference, all these preachers, the evangelists, the hot gospelers, the Bible thumpers, you know they call them evangelists, born again Christians, yes, at a conference, they asked, somebody suggested this, look, those people who are against, the, 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 against alcohol, please stand up, that you can go out when you return, Preach in your churches against the evil of alcohol. Please stand up. And Jimmy Swaggart says, nobody stood up. That means they all opted for alcohol. Why? And they reason. Jimmy Swaggart said, the reasoning is, he said, look, our Lord Jesus turned water into wine. If it is good enough for our God, it's good for us. Good logic. If it's good for your God, it's good for you. He says, that was pure grape juice. I said, it is the same W-I-N-E wine, your Christian scholar says, W-I-N-E wine in Greek, as the Lot, the prophet Lot, according to the Bible, he drank and cohibited with his daughters, committed incest night after night. Same W-I-N-E wine in Greek, that W-I-N-E wine, and this W-I-N-E wine. I said, the only way out is, here, the last and final revelation of God, Jesus Christ tells you that I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity, you're not fit to receive. Solution to all the problems that I can give you. I can give, solve all the problems of mankind till doomsday. But you are not fit. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, say, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit of truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. He said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And he truly glorified Jesus by absolving him from the calumnies of his enemies. His mother as well as Jesus. And the Christian world can never repay Muhammad for what he has done. What Muhammad has done for Jesus and for his mother. He is the true comforter, the true advocate of Jesus Christ. With these words, Mr. Chairman, I don't see the Chairman around, but Mr. Chairman and my dear brethren, I stop here and give you the opportunity as was uh, suggested by the Chairman that you have a time, you have the opportunity of asking questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much Mr. Dieter, for this inspiring talk. I will now give a one-minute outline for the lecture for those who came late. Mr. Dieter started talking about the legitim legitimacy and the illegitimacy of the both children of Abraham, and then he talked about how the Jews looked down the Arabs 1300 years ago and they are still looking down at the Arabs now. He went further and he talked about Mary and her status that he, she was not being married before the birth of Jesus and how miraculously Jesus was born. He went again and he talked about the importance of believing on Jesus as an apostle in the Muslim point of view. In Islam, a Muslim is not a Muslim unless he believes that G Jesus, peace be with him, is a messenger of Allah. 
he explained uh, also, he talked about alcohol and the problems of gambling, fortune telling, and the problems of all the problems that mankind suffer, and he showed both the viewpoints of Islam and what he had discussed with uh, Mr. Fuagat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are not here to antagonize anybody, not to be little any religion, caste, or creed. We are here to learn and to get the benefit of the talk. Uh, Mr. Gidat will now entertain questions and he will answer questions. If you have any question, please feel free and come to the mic. According to the Quran, and I'll, I'll admit, admit an, an ignorance of the Quran, okay? uh, was Jesus resurrected from the dead? The question was, according to the Quran, was Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead? Now, according to the Quran, he was neither killed nor crucified. See, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلَّ الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَ بْنُ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ That they said in boast that we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. In answer to that, God says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ That they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ But it was made to appear to them so. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمِ They have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَى الزَّنْ They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَقِينًا For a surety, they killed him not. And I am going to have a debate with a great Christian in your country of the Zwemer Institute, I think the night after tomorrow or tomorrow night in Kansas, uh, Dr. Robert Douglas on the subject of was Christ crucified. And I will prove from the Christian Bible, not from the Quran. The Quran says they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. You are satisfied. But no, to satisfy the Christian, uh, I will show to them from the Christian Bible that brothers, you have misunderstood the whole thing. You are reading something and actually you are misunderstanding it. And I will be proving that tomorrow night. Is it tomorrow night? Uh, tomorrow night in Kansas City, we are having a debate with um, Robert Douglas, Dr. Robert Douglas of the Zwemer Institute. We will deal with this subject fully there. Now the gentleman on the left. Question. How can Islam be true if you cannot stand up in the marketplace of ideas without the protection of a gun or prison? Indeed, does not the truth welcome criticism and debate? I would kindly request whoever asked a question to limit the question to the merit of the discussion. However, I will give Mr. Didet a chance to answer this question. But whoever has a question, please limit it, because Mr. Didet here is not to defend what governments are doing. He is only here to explain what he explained already. Now, Mr. See, the question is quite a rhetoric one about Muslim governments, their policies with regards to people coming in and perverting their people. From the point of view of the Muslim, is a perversion. From the worship of the one good, true God, people want to take away our children and worship human beings, created beings. To us, it is the highest form of blasphemy. Worship, instead of worshiping God, worshiping his creation, creatures. So if the governments are trying to defend, I'm not defending them, but I said if they are trying to defend in the best interests of the people, that is their business. But now, at the same time, it also poses another question from my side, that the Christian missionaries, you'll have to now acknowledge that they're using deceitful methods. Deceitful. Look at this. Look at this. This book here. No Muslim child will ever think that this is Christian. Look at this. Al-Kitab. Arabic calligraphy. You see, deceiving the Muslims in the guise of Islamic book, this. A close view, if you have, you see, you know, how easily the Muslim is t being taken up by this. Al-Kitab. This calligraphy is Islamic, but actually is the Gospel of St. Matthew. Can you imagine? Deceit. Now, I want to know whether your Christianity allows you to deceive people. In Pakistan, on my way, I delivered a lecture. While I am 
walking out, people all around, they surround me, they're shaking hands, you know, congratulating me. A small boy, about 12 or 14, he comes to me and he presents these three to me. This. This. Look at this. He presents this to me. I take it. I feel like kissing it. That's our habit. You know, Allah's kalam, if we come across, we kiss it, but the crunch was too great. People, you know, so I put it quickly in my pocket. For about three to four days, I had no chance of taking it out. Believe me, I'm not exaggerating. You know, I'm moving from place to place. I have no time. When I go to the hotel, I'm tired. I take off my jacket and throw it down one side. Then in Abu Dhabi or somewhere, I took it out and put this on my table next to the bed. Still, I'm not looking what it is, what it is. Then now, to move further, I said, now let me weed out all these papers that I've collected. And I start looking at this. I'm reading. Allah Muhammad. Look at it. Allah Muhammad. I'm reading. Allah Muhammad. Mm. I turn the back, it's calendar. Another one. Beautiful calligraphy. Islamic calligraphy. Look at this. In a hundred years, the Muslim child will never know what he's harboring in his house. Sticker, beautiful sticker. He's going to stir this out and put it in the Quran. Stick it in the Quran. You know what? Deceit. Christian missionaries, this is what they're doing to our people now. Deceiving them. This one here. He says, back of it, he said, the Lord's Prayer. He said, Lord's Prayer? We don't talk like that. The Lord's Prayer says, Al-Fatiha. We say Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Opening chapter, the Lord's Prayer. So what's this? Abbana. Abba. Say, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven in Arabic. Calligraphy, deceitful. You see what you're doing? Deceiving the people. This one here is not Allah Muhammad. For a week I couldn't see it. Look at this. Everybody says Allah Muhammad. Am I right? What do you see? It's not Allah Muhammad, it's Allah Muhabba. God is love. Deceiving people. I ask you, my brother missionary. You see, you're protesting. I said, look, is this your way of propagating your faith? If you have something good, some why don't you go out openly and talk to them? Give them your calligraphy, your language. Why? What are you trying to catch fish with? What are you doing now? Deceiving people. And here, another one. Coming from Ghana. A letter addressed to the Arab countries. I must read it to you. I must read it to you. What they are trying to do now. They're sending parcels, literature, into Muslim countries. And on the top of it, they put rubber stamps. This is asking now, do you think that if I send you bigger parcels, about twice or thrice the size, size sizes, I sent you with our franking stamp, which has the name Islamic Madrasatul. Islamic Madrasatul. I don't know what it really means. But as soon as the postman, the government then says, is the Islamic Madrasatul inside. Your, your religion allows you to deceive people like that? In the guise of, you know, Jesus Christ truly described them. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. They're trying to deceive you. You must be beware of them. So, brother, I'm not defending my Arab brothers. In Pakistan, you have the freedom there. Pakistan, your missionaries are making inroads. In Bangladesh, you have the freedom there. In India, you have the freedom there. See? In Indonesia, Malaysia, you have the freedom there. If some Arabs, you know, are more stringent in the regulations, but you're still getting through. Look, by deceit, by post, by radio, you're getting through. So what are you complaining about? What is your complaint? We have a legitimate complaint. Books that the Christians write. Every book. Inside, why I became a Christian, Sultan Muhammad Paul. When you flip the pages, verses from the Quran. For the Muslim, these verses are sacred, sacrosanct. Every child, every grown-up will kiss it and put it next to the Quran. Why? Because Allah's kalam is, he will not tear it, he will not burn it. You know the psychology of the Muslim and you're taking unfair advantage of it. Look at this. From Sufism to Islam, John Abdul Subhan. Look at this. Deceit? Does your religion allow you to deceive people like this? Catching fish? No, you tell me. So what are you crying about? What are you complaining about? In Africa, you have 35,000 full-time crusaders. Billy Graham, I'm sorry, Jimmy Swaggart, 
He's boasting that he's getting th through to 22 million Muslims through his religious service, 22 million. I'm asking, what are you crying about? Please. Don't, you know, like, you know, bashful maidens, you know, when you do the things, you're hurting the people's feelings, you're trying to steal our children, and now, when somebody tries to do some type of protection, you're wailing like a woman. Please don't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole lecture will be available on a cassette tape, and it could be uh, available at the Islamic Center of Tucson, address 1627 East First Street, Tucson, Arizona, 85719, and the telephone number there is 325-8992. Repeat, the address is 1627 East First Street, Tucson, Arizona, and the zip code is 85719. And not only this lecture is available there, you could request several lectures of Mr. Didet and some other scholars also, if you want to broaden your background about this. Uh, also, we have about 15 more minutes for the questions and answers. You are kindly requested. If you have any question, please feel free and come to the mic. Now the gentleman on the right can start. First of all, I'd like to clarify a point. Um, Earlier on tonight, you made a statement involving incarnation, involving a comparison of Christianity with Hinduism. Well, to, to clarify a point, we do not believe that the purpose of Jesus Christ coming down in the form of man was for the simple reason of understanding man's problems, but instead to take on the sin of the world. And because of that, there is no real parallel between an incarnation of comparing Hinduism faith with the faith of Christianity. And second, the point that I'd really like to address your entire issue tonight is that it seemed to me that it was more not necessarily who is Christ and what is his purpose but it was more like an attack upon men, Christian men your men I mean I, I, appreciate, I appreciate Muhammad and I appreciate all the great prophets but it's God that is above all of us and you know, we really have no right to compare ourselves on the same standpoint. And so to bring in man versus man is really irrelevant when it comes to God and Christianity and the Muslim faith. And so I'd like to know not necessarily what you believe on the attack of a Jimmy Swaggart or a Pat Robertson or your own people, but instead I'd like to know where is it you stand on Jesus Christ in comparison to God and your Muslim faith in a comparison between faiths, not men. I thought I made it abundantly clear with regards to what we accept Jesus to be. I said, and I repeat, that Jesus Christ, we believe, was one of the mightiest messengers of God. I said, we believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern-day Christians don't believe today. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead, by God's permission and of healing bo those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Then I said, there is a parting of the ways. And that is, you say that he's God, we say he's not God. You say he's God incarnate, we say God does not incarnate. Is that an attack? Or is this putting forth to you our position? Say, look, this is our position. Instead of hypocritically telling you, you know, he performed many miracles and what he did and he spoke as a child and all that. And says, now I scratch your back and you scratch my back. Was that what I was trying to do? I said, look, we accept all these things, we are going together, here is the parting of the ways. We say, he's not God, and he's not God incarnate, because God does not incarnate. And he's not the begotten son of God, because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex, and we are not to attribute such a quality to God. Now, this is the Muslim stand. If that goes against your grain, against your belief, now you have every right to ask. Mr. D. Dad, you see, Jesus is God. So what makes him God is he had no father. So some, every, every person must have a father. So I have to agree, yes. So Jesus must also have a father. So if you can't show a father, who is his father? I said, no, he has no father. He said, no, his father is God. What have you to say now? So he is the begotten son of God. He's God's only son. Talk like that. So what have you to say? We believe in the Holy Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. 
You know, this is what our book says now. Do you accept the Trinity? Talk like that. The first question, he did a beautiful job. He said, look now, we believe about Christ. Resurrection. So I said, look, if there's no death, there's no resurrection. Talk like that. Look, this is the question. So I said, now you want me to justify, even now, you want me to justify. I said, look, I'll show you from your own book that you read something and you misunderstand the thing that you're reading. Let's put it to the audience. Let I put it to you. But now you, I said, you're crying now like a woman, you know, bashful maiden. You said, now look, you said, you attack, what attack? What did I say disparaging about Jesus? You say that he called his mother woman in your book. I said, my book says, he says, Wabarambi walidati. He says, made me kind to my mother. Wajalani jabbaran shakia. And he's not made me, uh, oh, oh, oh. oh. And not, you know, uh, aggressive or abusing. Look, this is the Quran is defending Jesus. That he never did anything that you are attributing to him. That he called the learned men, men of Israel. He's the elders of his people. You generation of wipers. You whited sepulchers. You wicked and adulterous generation. You snakes. You fools. Look, this is your record. My book says, no, he never did anything like that. Is that an attack? If that is an attack, then, brother, you know, I apologize. By God, you know, I'm ashamed of myself. If this is an attack, the Quran says that he didn't do that. He respected his mother. That's an attack. Is that an attack? That he didn't abuse the people. Is that an attack? No, you must tell me, what, what is the attack? What is the attack? What, what did I say abusive about Jesus? I say he's one of the mightiest messengers of God. We love him. We respect him. We revere him. And I, we say, follow him. Follow him. Because if you followed him, you'll be a Muslim. You're not following him. However, the opportunity to the questioners, please, go ahead. Uh, in fact, uh, what I want to talk is the, uh, the my question is, uh, I believe all the gospel, the, the, the Torah, and the, the Quran itself. And the God also revealed the, the, the gospel and the, and the Bible and the Torah for guidance and light. But my question is, we see the error, or you pointed out the error of Christianity by saying that they worship according to the will of God. How about on the second side, on the other side of the coin, that also Muslims worship according to the will of God by idolizing hadith, tales, all these things. Why don't we see on the other side also? Because these people, we say that we follow the Quran, but they follow hadith, tales, a narration of other people which are not the words of God, totality. How do you see these things? I, I, you see, I think you have missed the mark. What I, the subject was, I don't know whether you people know, when you say the subject was two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and Biblical. Now the brother is coming out with something about the Muslims now, they're idolizing a book. Which book are they idolizing? Which book are you idolizing? Which book are you worshipping? We pray to Allah, we make salat, give zakat, go for pilgrimage, you know, we abstain from evil. I don't know what is the question. Where is what tr troubling you? I don't know. You see, the subject was about Jesus. Now you're talking about books and idolizing books. Which Muslim is worshipping a book? I want to know. Then I'll deal with that Muslim. But if you are that Muslim, then you tell me, which book are you idolizing? Okay, can I ask, can I ask no, no, look, please. This was supposed to be question time. There are so many people behind you. Please give them an opportunity. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. My, my question is one of curiosity. If, if the Muslim believes in Jesus Christ as being a prophet, then I assume that means that they're revering his message and what he was. So my curiosity is one in the Christian description of him, say by the prophet Isaiah, when he's referred to as the coming Messiah being Emmanuel, translated as God with us, and also in the men that he was with, that he trained up, who, when they relate his story, relate frequent instan instances where he, they say that no man comes to God but through me, and that I am the bread, the truth, the life, that I am God. So it's, I'm curious about how you handle that. It's a very, very pertinent and straightforward question. Straight request, you know, it calls for my response on that level. You see, uh, there are quotations in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament where a description is given about somebody, something, 
maybe the Messiah, it says, and he shall be called, I'm quoting, called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He shall be called Emmanuel. Now I'm asking people, I said, look, you've got 27 books in the New Testament, 27 books. In any one of these books, is it ever mentioned anywhere that Jesus was ever called Emmanuel? Was he called Emmanuel? He was called Jesus. He was called the Messiah. He was called the bread of life. He was called his, <laughs> the truth of God. All that, the word of God. Was he ever called Emmanuel in any one of these 27 books? Was he? No. So, it means it's not referring to him. He shall be called. Like you see, the man comes along, he's going to lecture to you people on the subject, uh, two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and Biblical, and that man shall be called the Messiah. Now, did anybody call me Messiah? No. So it's, there's no fulfillment. Can you see? If I wasn't called Messiah, I'm not the Messiah. He was called. I mean, nobody ever called him. He shall be called. I said, you see, that refers to Muhammad. Because Muhammad, you see in the Quran, in the Holy Quran you read, that Muhammad and Abu Bakr at the flight, they were in a cave and they were almost being caught out. And Abu Bakr says, he says, look man, they are almost, they are upon us. We are done for. And Muhammad says, Inna Allah ma'ana, Emmanuel. Inna Allah, God is with us. Emmanuel. Muhammad said that, not Jesus. Jesus on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. You see, at the critical moment, when you have God with you, who says that? Muhammad says that. Inna Allah ma'ana, which is the exact translation of Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus says, according to your record, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God is not with him. He's forsaken by God. That's at the critical moment. So this is not referring, no way referring to Jesus. With regards to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Mr. D, that, what have you to say to that? I said, I have to respond. He did say that. I am the way. He is the way. You see, in the context, now let's have a look at it in the context. You see, the disciples of Jesus misunderstood everything. Everything he spoke, they misunderstood. And his present-day disciples and followers misinterpret everything he uttered with apologies. You see, this is in John chapter 14. At the beginning, we are told, Jesus says, In my father's house there are many mentions. Had it not been for so, uh, so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And whither I go, ye know. And the way, ye know. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. In other words, I assume you understand what I'm talking about. He's telling his disciples, Do you know where I'm going and you know how to reach that destination? So they say, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? In other words, they misunderstood. Jesus is talking about spiritual matters, spiritual goals, spiritual destination. They are thinking of geographical locations, Washington, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, what? They think, it's a, look, we don't know where you are going and how are we going to get there? Look, misunderstanding. He's talking about spiritual things, they're thinking of geographical, geographical places. So Jesus in answer to that says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It means if you want to know where I'm going, look at me. The way to God is personified in me. Look at me. The truth of God is personified in me. Look at me. True life is personified in me. Look at me. If you follow me, you will reach your destination. And they misunderstood again. No, it was too heavy for them. Too heavy for them, for his disciples. The simple statements, they can't understand. Everything they're misunderstanding. So they said, look, Lord, show us the Father and it suffice at us. Look, all this you're talking about is too heavy for us. Too heavy. We don't know what you're talking about. Just show us God. If you can see God, we'll be satisfied. In answer to that, Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. You know, you ought to know better than that. You are a Jew. 
And as a Jew, you know, no man can see God and live. God is not seen at any time. That's what the scriptures say. He's not seen at any time. And no man can see God and live. If you see God, you'll be consumed. And you with me for so long? And you still asking such a silly, making such a silly request? You want to see God with your bodily eyes when you can't look at the sun? He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Meaning, if you understood what I am, you would have understood what God is. Same John is talking other places. Seeing they see not. Hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand. Means you see and you don't see. If you have seen me, meaning not physical seeing, because Philip had no defect in his eyes. If he had, Jesus would have healed him. If he can heal other people from the blindness, why not his disciple of his def defect in sight? No, he's not talking about physical sight. Means if you have seen me, if he had that has seen me, then if you understood what I am, you would have understood what God is. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make such a silly request. Wanting to see God with your bodily eyes. Way to God, you see, that every prophet of God, in his own time, in his own dispensation, is the only way to God. In the time of Moses, Moses was the way to God. If you wanted another way, the children of Israel chose another way, through the golden calf, for which 24,000 people were killed. The Jews, killing Jews. God's command says, destroy them. This rubbish, you know, they're worshipping a calf, kill them. One book says 23,000, other says 24,000. We kill for that. Why? Because they chose another way. There's only one way to God, is through the way of the prophet of God. The prophet of the time, he tells you, in the time of Noah, Noah was the way to God. You want to be saved? Get into the ark. That's all. No fasting, no prayer, no zakat, no pilgrimage, nothing. Just get into the ark. Salvation is yours. That's all. You see, he's the way to God. Anybody who got in, saved. From physical destruction as well as spiritual destruction. Listen, happened to the prophet of God. In the time of Jonah, Jonah was the way. In the time of Jesus, Jesus was the way. In the time of Muhammad, this is his dispensation. Muhammad is the way. If you want another way, it will not be accepted from you. Because Christ told you that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He had the message. He had the solutions. But now he didn't have the time. The poor man is on the run. As soon as he opened his mouth, the Jews were after his blood. And a man on the run, he's got no time to give you all the teaching. So he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all things. He said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And we are prepared to reason with you. Let us have a dialogue. I have written a book called What the Bible Says About Muhammad. This deals with prophecies from the Old Testament. I have delivered a lecture on Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. It's available on videotape. I haven't had a chance to write the book yet. But inshallah, God willing, I'll write the book. You see? So in other words, now let us have a dialogue. Who is the spirit of truth? Who is the comforter? And what does this mean when he says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. He's the way to God. He's not the goal. To the Christian, he is the goal, he is not the way. He said that we must talk and reason how I see it, how you see it. And by that we might arrive at truth. What truth is, really is. How? The next question, huh? I had to narrow my many questions down to this one. Um, does, does God, according to the Islam faith, provide forgiveness for sins? And if so, how do we know that? What is, what is God's promise to us that... How does he provide that promise? I'll that. And okay. I'll that. You, say, and? you see now, this is an old machine. Old machine. So while I'm answering one, I forget the other. And then you might think that I try to hoodwink the people and you. So therefore, if you ask one question at a time, you'll be more merciful to me. <laughs> then you take a chance, another one, and another one, I don't mind. Till 12 o'clock tonight, I'm at your disposal. Okay. But if you can, just one at a time, so it makes it easy for me. Please. Okay. Right. Okay. Does God, according to the Islam faith, provide forgiveness for sins? Yes. That forgiveness of sin is, you sincerely repent of the wrongs that you have done. God forgives. He does not need blood, the blood of animals or of mankind, no blood. He says in the Holy Bible, he says, in the book of Isaiah, he said, I forgive sins for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. What he wants from you is come to him, sincerely make an effort, and forgive. And the parable in the Bible, 
the prodigal son, if you remember, prodigal son in the Gospel of St. Luke, prodigal son. Father, a father had two sons. Who is the father in this parable? God. He is the father. He's got two sons. Means two types of his creation. One was who remains with the father. You know, prays, does everything, nice, good chap, goody, goody, good fellow. The other fellow, like most of us, he says, look, dad, give me my inheritance, what belongs to me, my talents, all the talents, give it to me, and I will make into the world and fend for myself. And the loving father said, all right, I know it's not good for you, but since you ask for it, have it. There, take it. And the son took it, which we all take. See, the talents. He's given us a lot of talents. And he went out into the world, as the gospel describes, and met bad company, mixed with bad company, became a drunkard and what and not. Maybe had AIDS and everything. He's lying in the gutter, you know, missing his pants. Now in that condition, he realizes that he would have been better off if he was with the father. So he makes a comeback. He makes a comeback. And the father sees him from afar, says the gospel. And the father runs to the son. He says, this my son was dead, is now alive. He was lost, is now found. He wasn't dead. Spiritually he had departed. So that was death. He was lost spiritually. Now he's found. So he embraces the son, welcomes him, and tells the other son, he said, look, sacrifice the fatted calf that we may celebrate the return of the prodigal. Whose calf? Whose calf was that? The father's. See, the father out of his bounty, he makes the sacrifice. He's not asking his son, he said, look, you squandered all my talents, all my wealth. Now you go and stay with the swines, the pigs, in the pig sty for seven years. Look after the pigs, and after that I'll give you promotion to the sheep and, and the cows before you come into the house. That is not God. That's Shylock. Shylock talks like that. God Almighty, you make a sincere effort to return. He says, come, welcome. No price asked, no blood, no sacrifice. If he is a sacrifice is called for, it's his own. Out of his own goodness, he says, I'm prepared to celebrate. He celebrates your homecoming. And the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, tells us the very same situation, same principle. So the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Means you who do wrong, you'll perish. Unfortunately, in Christian literature, there's a full stop. No Christian literature ever completes the verse. They put a full stop. Where there's no full stop, they put a full stop. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And they say, all have sinned, and so they have fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody perishes. No, no, please, continue. It's a semicolon there in the King James Version. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam sinned. We his children, we will not bear that iniquity. Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. The son shall not be the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. His son, Adam's son, we, his children. Last June, in San Francisco, 300,000 sodomites, you call them gays, they gathered on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. God will not ask Adam, he said, look at your children, that's right. what are they doing? They're going to get AIDS, they'll get AIDS. No, God won't ask Adam. See, this is the law of God. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The good thing the good man does, God says he'll get his reward. And the wicked fellow does wicked things, he will be punished. Way of salvation is there. He said, but if the wicked will turn, means repent, come back. But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is salvation. You come back, you come back where God wants you to be, you ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you. He's not like Shylock, wanting a pound of flesh from you. He doesn't do that. He forgives sins for his own sake, not for your sheep and goats and Christ. Nothing. He wants nothing. He wants, needs no blood. He wants you. Your sincere effort wanting to come back. This is salvation. Um, I have read the Quran, but perhaps not as thoroughly as I might have, so please forgive any ignorance that I exhibit. Um, <clears throat> this evening you've made it very clear that there are severe discrepancies, um, even contradictions between the Gospels and the Quran. And yet I seem to remember that the Quran regards the Gospels very highly. And I was wondering if you could clarify for me what 
the precise Quranic position is on the Gospels? The term Gospel translated into Arabic is Injil. And we in Islam, we say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Quran. We believe in all these heavenly books as books from God. So the Injil translated into English say gospel. Gospel into Arabic is Injil. So what does the Quran say or the Muslims say about the Injil? I say Injil we believe in. Injil is the revelation which God Almighty gave to the Holy Prophet Jesus. Whatever God gave him is the Injil. We read in the scriptures, in the Matthew, Gospel of St. Matthews, that Jesus went somewhere and he preached the gospel. Translated in Jeel. Mark says he went to a certain other place and he preached the gospel. In Jeel. Luke says he went to some place and he preached the in gospel. In Jeel. Then John tells us that Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the in gospel. In Jeel. I am asking that in Jeel was Matthew, Mark, Luke and John under his arm. Did he have it? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts, Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Thessalonians, you know, James. Is that what he had under his arm? The answer is no. What did he have? A book? Did he? No. It is the revelation which God gave him. That is what he was preaching. The knowledge that God gave him he was preaching. That is what we believe in. It's from God. We speak very highly of it. But now what you are presenting to us is the gospel according to St. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Mark, the gospel according to St. Luke, the gospel according to St. John, which you in your Arabic translations translate as Injile Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Johanna. That's how your scholars translate these gospels. Injile Matthew, Luca, Marcus, Lucas, Johanna. I said, look, we are believing in the Injil Isa, the Injil that was given to Jesus, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you can produce the Gospels according to St. Jesus, that is what we believe in. We'd like to see that, if you have it. That is the one that we respect and revere. I hope that makes it clear. Earlier there was, there was a question in reference to I am the way, the truth, and the life that you answered. And I found it to be very logical answer, but there was something that I found kind of missing in the puzzle. When, when he is referring to, I am the way, the truth, and the life, all of us being intelligent people, I'm sure we're to see, even being a literalist in the sense that that is what it is saying, I am the way, the truth, the life. Now, had it been that he was the prophet of the time, and there was David and Solomon and etc., 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 before him, had it been a sense to where he was put on the same level of those other prophets, and they all were the way, the truth, and the life, according to that period of time, I find it interesting that at no time in, the, in my biblical knowledge of the Bible does it ever state that King David or King Solomon, or in any reference, anybody else ever made the mention, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If they were indeed the way, the truth, and the life at that time, why is it that they never made that same statement? You see, there are so many ways of saying the same thing. So many ways. You say the same thing, you don't put it in that order. Like the very fact, the fact of salvation, you know, being saved. When I said in the time of Moses, now you have to now tell me that it wasn't so. In the time of Moses, I say Moses was the way to God. In the time of Abraham, Abraham was the way to God. He's telling people, he said, look, if you want to get to God, behave like this. This is what you do, God will love you and forgive you your sins. That is, in other words, he said, look, look at me, the way I'm doing, the way he prayed, Moses, the people must pray. The way he fasted, they must fast. The way he abstained from all Ill, evil, they do the same. If they cut a goat, he must, they must also cut a goat. Whatever the prophet of God of the time does, the people must follow. You don't say, look, I am the way, the truth. The same statement he must make, or did Jesus make such a statement? That also you can't prove. But we accept it. That look, he could have said that, but did he say that in that form? Did he, what language did he speak? You have it in Greek. You have the whole thing written in Greek. Did he speak Greek? 
which is not the case because a man, Jew, coming to the Jews will speak the Jewish language. It doesn't make sense that he's going to speak to them in Greek when you preserve the word Allah, Allah, Lama Sabachthani. You see, to show you that he spoke his own mother tongue, but the rest of the Gospels, his preachings, not preserved in his language. So now we are not going into all the details, but the fact of the matter is that you can see the spirit of what he's saying is, follow me. He said, he is not of me, who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Did he want you to get crucified? No. The way I carry my responsibility, you carry yours. That is the way. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, most assuredly, I'm telling you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you, unless you're better than the Jew. And I'm asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? He says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Ask my Christian brethren, ask them, do you keep the laws and the commandments? He says, no. I said, why don't you? He says, now we are living under grace. The law is nailed to the cross. I said, where did you get that? So he says, Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians. So who's this? What's this? Who's that? He says, Paul, 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 Paul. I said, who is your Lord and Master? He said, Jesus. I said, what did Jesus say? Nobody knows. Nobody ever quotes Jesus. I said, look, this is what Jesus said. You are not of me if you don't take up your cross and follow me. The way I carry my responsibilities, you carry yours. It's a manly religion he's preaching, not a soft soaping, you know, cowardly religion. Somebody else pays for your sins. You get AIDS and Jesus takes the injections. Imagine, you get VD, gonorrhea, and Jesus takes the injections. Does it make sense? You have a headache and Jesus takes the pill. Does that make sense? No. I said, look, he's a manly religion, but now you have misunderstood the whole thing. You are not following Jesus. You're not listening to Jesus. If you listen to Jesus, you'll be a Muslim. You are following Paul, 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 Paul. He derailed Jesus' teaching. Derailed the whole thing. You don't have to do any good works today to be saved. You just believe in the blood, says Paul. Jesus says, you must be better than the Jew. Otherwise, no heaven for you. I'm asking between the two of them, who must you listen? Jesus says the disciple is not greater than the master. The master is Jesus. A million disciples tell you to go and eat pigs. You can now eat pigs. Because Peter had a dream. The master says, thou shalt not eat the flesh of the swine. Because he confirms the law of Moses. To the letter. One jot or one tittle. Jot is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Not even that amount is to go out of the law, he says. And you have done away with the whole law. He says not even that much. And whosoever shall do such a thing is called the least in the kingdom of heaven. You worthless rubbish, garbage. That's what he says. But you don't follow him. Therefore, you see, Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book. Michael H. Hart here in America, New York. Hart Publication Company. The hundred, or the top hundred, or the greatest hundred in history. He gives us a list of one hundred most influential men in history. From Adam alayhi salam, from Adam to current times. He gives you a list of these hundred great names. And then he puts them in their order of seniority. Who is number one? Who is number ten? Who is number ninety-nine? And he puts Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa number one. The first person in that hundred list is Muhammad. Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, number three. So he has to answer, account for it. He just can't just, maybe some Arab bribe the fellow, you know, to say, look, put Muhammad number one and put your God number three. It's possible, but not probable. It wouldn't enter the Arab mind to do such a thing. You see, I wish they had done these things, but they have. They can't use that money that way. There are other ways of using it. Why does he put Jesus Christ number three? Because he says the honor for Christianity is to be shared between Paul and Jesus. In actual fact, Paul is the real founder of Christianity, not Jesus Christ. And you see in the writings of all the evangelists, what are they teaching? You see Paul, 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 Paul. Nobody tells you what Jesus says. 
Jesus says you must not even look upon a woman to lust after her. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. But they all dance with other people's wives and daughters. They preach this in Sundays. They put you into ecstasy. Sermons. What Jesus said. But as soon as they go out, they're dancing with other people's wives and uh, daughters. With bare backs and bosoms almost coming out with a few drinks to weaken the resistance. And they think nothing of it. Why? Because Jesus has, didn't have the time to explain. So he said, somebody else is coming after me who will guide you into all truth. And that spirit of truth is Muhammad. That comforter is Muhammad. I look forward, next time when I come here, inshallah, I'd like to deliver a, talk, a, a lecture on that subject. How? You have the opportunity. In, in reference to my uh, previous question, you did, you did uh, satisfy the, the question that God does provide forgiveness for sin. Um, what well, I'm, I'm curious that if if he does do this, what how can how can people of the Islam faith be be certain that they have been forgiven? Be certain that they'll make it to heaven, that they will finally reach the destination. You see, the mis- Muslim is given a formula. The formula is same as I read out to you from the book of Ezekiel. Same, no difference. That. But if the sinner, if the sinner will repent from all that he has done and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. I mean, spiritually, he will not be destroyed. If you repent and now try to the best of your ability, you try to do right, it is acceptable in the sight of God. The very fact that now you eschew what you have done, you might make, you might fall again and again a million times. But sincerely, if you repent to God, He will overlook your faults and forgive you a million times. This is the God of mercy. You say He's a God of love. Then He must be a God of love. He's not like Shylock wanting his pound of flesh. Look, you slipped and now I must make you to pay for it. You made this mistake. I must now twist your ears. I must pull your eyebrows. I must pull your eyelashes. This is not God. You know, this is Shylock you're describing to me. God is not Shylock. He forgives sins, the Bible says. He said, I forgive sins for my own sake. Not for your sheep and goats and cows and blood. For my own sake. The thing you have to do is like the prodigal son. Just make up your mind to return. That's all. You made a mistake? He says, I repent, O Lord. Forgive me and I will not do it again. Maybe you fall again. Sincerely. You say, O Lord, I have fallen again. Forgive me and he'll forgive you. A million times. Because he is not Shiloh. He doesn't want blood. He wants you. He is a loving father in heaven. We believe in that. But now the concept that the Christian gives, that he must have blood. We say, this is not God. Adam and Eve sinned, says the Christian. They ate the forbidden fruit, for which they were kicked out. Kicked out of the garden. I am asking, is that not punishment enough? From felicity, anything they wanted, they could have had. They want great... Is there. They want chops? Mm, is there. Everything they wanted, no exertion, no sweating. They got everything. Now they kicked out from that condition. Is that not punishment enough? No, says the Christians, not enough. So God goes out of his way now here and he curses them. He's thrown them out, now he curses them. That you, women, for what you have done, you must now bear children in pain and suffering. Labor, you must labor in childbirth as a punishment for what Eve did, poor thing. And you man, you must sweat for your bread. No more easy life for you. I'm asking, is that not punishment enough? Still kicked out, now cursed. Men and women and still we suffering. Everybody's got to sweat for his bread. And every woman who has children in pain and suffering, labor. Not enough? No, says the Christian. He said, everybody goes to hell. For what? For the original sin. What Adam and Eve did. God now is going to pursue you. At the beginning of 1986, there will be 4.8 billion people on earth. And everyone goes to hell, says the Christian. Why? Because of what Adam and Eve did. The original sin. You inherited it. It's part of your nature now. And God is going to make you to pay for that. Kicked out of the garden. Sweating for my bread. Woman bearing children, parents suffering. Not enough. Now he's going to put us all in hell. For what Adam did. I'm asking... Brother, did Adam ask you before eating the apple? Did he? He asked you. Shall I eat the apple? Did he ask you? No. My sister there, did he ask you before eating the apple? How can God hold you responsible? Is he a lunatic? 
this God is a lunatic, going to make you responsible for something that you were not consulted about? Does it make sense? Huh? It's a, you know, major...